Good morning students. Yesterday we had seen uh, the manorial estate uh, that is uh, the whole uh, the whole estate being around associated with a huge manor where the nobility used to live and their family used to live and hundreds uh, of people would be working in those lands and uh, we had also seen that at that, uh, that point in time that we, remember guys we are talking about a period that is about a th about thousand uh, at least one thousand years ago so that was a time when uh, indust uh, industry was only and only agriculture the people the people used to uh, depend on agriculture for their livelihood the whole societies were uh, about uh, agriculture the whole trading was about agriculture so naturally anyone who controlled the land and the maximum amount of land would be naturally the most uh, rich and the prosperous one because everything was about uh, agriculture and you can grow crops and vegetables uh, and fruits and whatever it is only if you have land right so and so we also saw that the, there were three main orders that definitely uh, we have now uh, also completed the clergy uh, right and uh, today uh, we would be and uh, we have finished the night of course and today the we would um, no sorry uh, we haven't finished the clergy I, I don't think so we have finished the clergy so let's start the clergy the first order the clergy the catholic church had its own laws own lands given to it by the rulers and could levy taxes imagine students this is a huge power you know where the church can uh, actually uh, levy taxes it can impose taxes it was a very powerful institution naturally so which did not depend on the king so students you have to understand if just uh, just uh, just look at today's world no amount of tax can be imposed on the people without the consent of the government whether it happens to be the state government or the central government you cannot do it as you wish right but at that point in time do you think today the temples can actually say if there is a major temple in your area the temple priest can impose certain taxes no it is unimaginable uh, unimaginable but that at point in time the church could uh, levy taxes or uh, for the to, uh, into the people who used to work in their lands and at the head of the western church was the pope uh, we know that uh, church, pope the institution of pope stands even today and pope uh, of course rules from vatican he lived in rome uh, the and the christians in europe were guided by bishops and clerics who constituted the first order most villages had their own church where people assembled every sunday to listen to the sermon by the priest and to pray together uh, everyone could not become a priest uh, serfs were banned as were the physically challenged women could not become priests men who became priests could not marry bishops were the religious nobility like lords who owned vast landed states and the bishops also had the use of vast states and lived in grand palaces the church was entitled to a tenth of the of whatever the peasants produced from their land <clears throat> over the course of the year called a tith okay money also came in in the form of endowments uh, made by the rich for their own welfare and the welfare of their deceased relatives in the afterlife students exactly the same situation which uh, was there in the other societies as well and definitely the indian society much before uh, this kind of system started there in europe we had been following this kind of system for thousands and thousands of years right so uh, let, let's pick up. everyone could not become a priest yes in india even today everyone cannot become a priest uh, or temple priest at all you know you have to be a brahmin to start with right uh, you know shudra would not become a temple priest and even if he chose to you know that temple i wonder how many uh, people uh, and devotees would actually go to those temples now serfs were banned as were the physically challenged now definitely uh, in europe the situation now has improved that it is not that the poor people cannot become um, you know priests uh, yes uh, now that has definitely changed but not the other things the physically challenged you have you any have you ever visited any church where you've seen the priest on a wheelchair i don't think so i haven't
okay uh, women could not become priests they still can't in catholic church they still can't become priests probably in protestant churches and the other uh, protestant churches they can but not in catholic churches men who became priests could not marry in catholic church still the, uh, the men who become priests they still can't marry okay uh, in in protestant church they can but not in catholic okay like lords uh, bishops were the religious nobility that is still true uh, students priest is someone else and uh, nobility is uh, 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 i'm sorry and bishop is someone else you know you can have 20 uh, churches within a small town like uh, dehradun and masuri and probably 40 or 50 right but then the bishop would only be one you can have every church would have a priest but bishop no they lot of the bishop, bishop is appointed uh, for a for a huge area you know it could be uh, um, maybe in the whole state of uttarakhand there could probably just be two, one or two or maximum three bishops yes and but there might be hundreds and thousands of churches but not as uh, but not uh, more than three or four uh, or two or three bishops because they actually are immensely powerful people in the christian world okay a money came in the form of endowments made by the rich for their own welfare and welfare of the deceased relatives guys this is something which has been happening in indian temples for thousands of years where the richest of the rich people uh, the uh, the rajas the maharajas they would uh, Uh, give uh, lavish grants to the temples uh, uh, in their area you know if tirupati and all these many many temples jagannath temple uh, in and many temples in kerala in tamil nadu they for generations they have been getting tons and tons of gold and silver and you just name it uh, by the rich people of course and some of the important ceremonies conducted by the church copied formal customs of the feudal elite in the act of kneeling while praying with hands clasped and the heads bowed was an exact replica of the way in which knight conducted himself while taking vows of loyalty to his lord similarly the use of the term lord for god was another example of feudal culture that found its way into the practices of the church does the religions the religious and the way worlds of feudalism shared many customs and symbols there is nothing to explain here you can i am sure you understood what this paragraph says uh, monks apart from church devout christians had another kind of organization some deeply religious people close to live chose to live in isolated Uh, conditions in contrast to clerics who lived among people in towns and villages they lived in religious communities called abbeys or monasteries often in places very far from human habitation two of the more well known monasteries uh, that was established uh, by saint benedict in italy in 529 ad and of cluny in burgundy in uh, 910 burgundy would be in france in 910 ad so uh, we are talking about a certain sect of people who would be serving the church and lord jesus christ uh, they would be the clergy you know they would be living among the people they would be based in towns they would be based in cities the villages and they would be very very social but then now we are talking about a certain set of people who would uh, live isolated lives they would be having like in india students like you know again if uh, i would to make things simpler for you i would give you an indian example we have certain ashrams in great isolation located in some wilderness somewhere where some uh, the pujaris and the scholars and they would be living the students uh, 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 today you see in haridwar and uh, rishikesh Uh, many many ashrams uh, but uh, and they have uh, become but they uh, but those ashrams have been there for many 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 years bef- much before uh, pe- places like dehradun and rishikesh became urban towns where which would attract tourists from across the country and where hundreds and thousands of people would be visiting all the time these areas and these places were considered to be isolated places 50 years ago 
right of course because india's population uh, you you know it is very difficult to have uh, isolation and wilderness these days unless it happens to be some national park owned by government of india or maybe some uh, piece of land owned by indian army everything is you know uh, everything can be encroached you know every land can be encroached so there's no privacy anymore but then uh, when when it started that's what the intention was it, the same in india same in europe monks took vows to remain in the abbey for the rest of their lives they had monks we had monks right buddhists have monks indians have us we hindus have it so we chose to it was the same there and same here that for the rest of their lives and to spend their time in prayer study and manual labor like farming unlike priesthood this life is open to both men and women men became monks and women nuns they were talking about men becoming monks and women becoming uh, nuns in 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 our own tradition we had a bhikshu and a bhikshuni and uh, all of that who would be uh, just minding their own business they would not be living among uh, the you know, society and become uh, would like to be a part of the society at all they would just mind their own business spend their time in prayers and study and studying scriptures learning scriptures meditation that's what it was that's what their life meant and except in a few cases all abbeys were single sex communities that is there were separate abbeys for men and women like priests monks and nuns uh, and nuns did not marry uh from small communities that's uh, that's uh, uh you know there's a great similarity to us uh, from small communities of 10 or 20 men women monasteries grew to communities often of several hundred and large uh, and large buildings and, uh, and uh, landed estates with attached schools and colleges and hospitals they contributed to the development of the arts abbe hildegard was a gifted musician and it did not um, and did much to develop the practice of community singing of prayers in church now uh, yeah, students uh, abes hildegard you remember we just had finished when we were talking about uh, here in the in the 12th century abes hildegard of benen wrote who would think of herding the entire cat in one stable cows donkeys sheep you remember this quotation from her that yes just like we had in our own tradition where we were very particular about our varna tradition where we felt that yes um, you know brahmin kshatriya shudra and vaishya uh, was imperative and it was uh, it was the right thing to segregate uh, human beings based on uh, their practices and their um, you know and whatever they worked yeah, it was the same uh, there and we are again quoting abe hilkrad who was a gifted musician and did much to develop the practice of community singing of prayers in church from 13th century some groups monks called freyas chose not to be based on in monastery but to move from place to place preaching to the people and living on charity the students again there is a great amount of similarity where you know that um, even in our tradition for thousands of years we've had the same kind of uh, uh, practice whereby there would be certain bhikshus and bhikshur bhikshunis who would be um, begging for alms and they would be collecting whatever uh great food grains they used to get and they would come to the ashram and they would mind their business within the ashrams but also at the same time even today you have certain in india you have certain sadhus who never stay in one place they keep moving around uh the country they sometimes they would be meditating in certain caves sometimes they would be meditating in certain um near the river bank sometimes in jungles and that's how they they keep moving from one place to another they rarely stay in one place sometimes they would be spending their times in the in the crematorium uh, the cremation grounds and the graveyards and then that's how uh, uh, they like to spend their lives and so it was and this has been an indian tradition for as long as anyone can remember and it is the same thing that they are talking about here thank you